Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu, brothers and sisters and friends. Right, we've gone through an interesting journey. We've basically talked about the philosophy of science, the limitation of science. We've talked about the epistemic value of scientific conclusions. In other words, as per the teachings, if you like, or the study of the philosophers of science and scientists themselves, they come to the conclusion that science is not the gospel truth. <laughs> it doesn't lead to certainty. And we said this is the beauty of science, it's supposed to change. You may have another observation that you currently haven't observed that can contradict previous conclusions, which shows the iterative and ever-changing nature of science and that's one of its beauties we change our scientific conclusions based upon the evidence we have at hand as Professor Elliot Sober says who's a well-respected philosopher of science he wrote the book The Philosophy of Biology he wrote the famous well not famous but the very interesting and academic essay called Empiricism in I believe it's called The Rootledge, the Rootledge Companion to the Study of the Philosophy of Science or something like that I don't remember, it's in my notes. But the point is, Professor Elliot Sober says that scientists are always limited to the observations they have at hand. So we may have other observations that contradict previous conclusions. And we saw this in cosmology. We have data, we had data in the 19th century, and that data we used to form a certain conclusion. What was that conclusion? That basically the universe didn't begin. The steady state theory, the universe is static. But as we progress scientifically and the kind of technology that we developed in order to look at indirect evidence, we change our conclusion. Because now we have background radiation, now we have this, that and the other, and we form the conclusion now that the universe is dynamic in nature. And we also said that since we have some data about the universe at the moment, we have conflicting models, around 17 different models to explain the data that we have. The data is the same, but you have 17 complete, competing explanations that according to some cosmologists and physicists, they basically have the same weight. This is called underdetermination, that the data is underdetermined, meaning you have the same data, but different explanations for that data, and they all have the same value. That's why you don't have a consensus at the moment concerning what's happening in cosmology. Which again goes to show that you know, the ever-changing and influx nature of science, it's supposed to change. There's not one sincere scientist, not one sincere academic, not one sincere philosopher of science that would basically say that science is static. And we discussed, even if you have a realist approach to science, even if you have an anti-realist approach to science, even you have an instrumentalist approach to science, the point is they all conclude that scientific theories are defeasible, meaning they can change. You may have future evidence or different data in the future that contradicts your theoret theoretical perspectives, contradicts your theory, contradicts your theory that had good predictions, <laughs> that made good predictions. And don't forget what Professor Elliot Sober says that Falsified theories, theories that have proven to be false, still have great predictive power. So the point I'm trying to say here is that we understand the nature of science now. It's not the gospel truth, it's something that we love, something that we respect, something that we want to do, something that is considered as a rahmah, as a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But its conclusions do not have a weight that you can describe as absolute and certain. Even Socrates, years ago, thousand years ago, thousands of years ago, made the same point. Like science doesn't lead to knowledge, meaning that it's an absolute claim. And that's the beauty of science, it's supposed to change. We also discussed just because science works, it doesn't mean that particular theory that is working is true. And we gave different examples like Newton's laws of physics, which are not absolutely true. We know this. They've been replaced by Einstein's understanding, right? And we also spoke about, for example, the concept of phlogiston. Phlogiston was a theory that was working in the 1700s, right? It was working. Phlogiston was a theory that in combustible objects, that when you burn them, 
they had phlogiston inside and they released phlogisticated air. That was a workable theory. And Dan Rutherford in the 1770s, he used that workable theory to give us a truth. What was that truth? That there is nitrogen. That he discovered nitrogen from this workable theory. Isn't that amazing? But yet this workable theory is now known to be false. So this teaches us that you can get a truth like nitrogen from a workable theory that's based on a falsehood. And it also shows us that just because something works, it doesn't mean it's absolutely true. And that's the unique thing about science. It's the beautiful thing about science. And there's a debate with the realists and the anti-realists and the instrumentalists that hasn't been resolved, but they all agree that science can change. We use different references in the philosophy of science. Hugh Goetsch, Barker, Gilligan, Kitcher, others. And they all conclude that the science is revisable. Science is revisable. You could have paradigm shifts as well. So the point here is that we understand the epistemic nature of scientific conclusions. They're not absolute, they're not certain. And that's the beauty of science. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. So this section, we're going to now focus on the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Qur'an itself. This is where we start discussing the Qur'an. This is where we start using amazing, rational and classical arguments for the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at the same time, showing the depth of the Qur'an, showing the depth of the book of Allah in terms of its spirituality. When we do tadabbur, when we ponder upon the verses of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it opens a almost eternal ocean of meaning. Rather, to be more accurate, an eternal ocean of gems and reflections. Because meaning doesn't change in the Qur'an. Tafsir is about the meaning. We discussed this earlier. We can't play around with the meaning. This is the job of the ulama, the job of mufassirin, the job of those who are qualified to basically understand the meaning of the Book of Allah. However, tadabbur is when we reflect upon the meaning and we understand the implications of the meaning. And this is where we get the gems of the Qur'an, the kind of deep spirituality of the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we're going to go through what is the Qur'an. We're going to discuss that it's a book that makes you think. It deals with your existential reality. It deals with the fact that, you know, dealing with the existential questions, who are you? Whose are you? For whom are you? Why are you? And maybe for some people on a Friday night, where are you? <laughs> right? So from this perspective, you know, the Quran deals with these profound questions and is deeply spiritual, giving us lessons about forgiveness, lessons about forbearance, lessons about tolerance, lessons about love, compassion, justice. Oh, this book is four-dimensional. It deals with everything. And then we're going to be talking about the intellectual aspect of the Qur'an, the fact that it produces a challenge for mankind. In Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 23, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a challenge to humanity. If you don't think this book is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then bring one chapter like it and call on your witnesses and supporters besides Allah if you're truthful in your claim. And this opens an array of arguments for the Qur'an. One argument we're going to focus on is the literary and linguistic miracle of the Qur'an. And hopefully I'm going to articulate to you, or I'm going to convey to you how to articulate this to non-Arabs and non-Muslims without knowing any Arabic. You don't have to know the Arabic, nor do they. Obviously that's not the best position to be in, you should learn Arabic. But the point here is, from an outreach perspective, showing that this book, we have good reasons to believe in it, you can articulate a very unique argument for the Qur'an via its language and still not need to know anything about Arabic and the person you're talking to doesn't have to know about Arabic either. Isn't that fascinating? It's not magic. Okay, I'm going to try and explain this to you. So, it has an intellectual challenge. Then we're going to talk about the unique structure of the Qur'an. It's very interesting that the Qur'an was revealed over a 23 year period for specific times and places, right? For specific times and places. And yet every single one of its chapters has its own unique literary coherence, literary structure. And we're going to use the second chapter of the chapter in the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, as an example for this. Surah Al-Baqarah, for example, which is known as the cow, has 286 verses, was revealed over a nine-year period, specifically for two years, and many of its verses were revealed for specific times and places. However, the Quran has an amazing type of composition structure. 
It's known as ring composition. And each section of the ring has a ring composition. And each section of the ring has a ring composition. It's a ring within a ring within a ring. It's so fascinating. When I show you the slide, it's going to blow your mind. You, would o you can only conclude the one who gave us this book is the one who knew the future. That's the only conclusion you can make. And this is studied by Western academics, not only the, the Muslims in the classical tradition, that our ulama, that we stand on the shoulders, you know, they, they're our giants, aren't they? Uh, Arabic linguists, our ulama, like Al-Ghazali and, and many others. Basically, this was studied, but it's also studied contemporarily, if that's a word, yeah, in a contemporary sense, by the likes of Professor Raymond Farin, for example, and many others. So we're going to discuss this, and we're going to discuss some lost knowledge that the Qur'an revived concerning some historical man manusheh, accuracies in the Qur'an. And we're going to give the example of Yusuf alayhi salam and, and, and Musa alayhi salam, Joseph and Moses, that in their particular periods, Allah mentions a particular title for the leader of the Egyptians. Right? It's very interesting that it's historically accurate. Although hieroglyphs was a dead language at that time, and the other source text to give us information about the reality of the Egyptians, they were false. For example, the Bible got it wrong, and so did the Torah and the historians of the time. So it's very interesting, how did the Qur'an you know, bring about this true knowledge? Again, it shows that it's from the one that's all-knowing, all-aware. And we're going to talk about the impact of the Book of Allah. We've already talked about the multi-layered and multi-leveled approach to the Qur'an, how to understand its natural phenomena. So, let's proceed. Now, what's very interesting, brothers and sisters, is before we start to discuss the Qur'an, let's define the Book of Allah. There's an interesting apt definition by Az-Zarqani, and he basically describes the Qur'an in the following way. He says, the Qur'an is the Arabic speech of Allah, which he revealed to Muhammad wasallam in wording and meaning, and which has been preserved in the compiled written pages of the Qur'an, and has reached us via recurrent reporting. Let's break this down. So the Book of Allah is the Qur'an. It's revealed in the Arabic language. There's lots of wisdoms concerning the fact that the Book of Allah was revealed in the Arabic language. If you study the Arabic language, you'll understand, if you like, its philosophy. It's a very mathematical language. It's a language that has a particular meaning with, for a word in a certain context. But if you change the context, it may have another meaning. One word may have many meanings, right? And there's a kind of linguistic aspect to the verses of the Qur'an, depending on the order of the words, can change the meaning, the implication as well. So it's a very, very profound a language, it's very deep. We know based on the root structure, so therefore you can have an array of meanings for a particular word. That's why we know that Arabs have like, what, over 100 words for the, 100 words for, for the, for the camel. In the English language, you just have camel. Yeah, it's not, it's linguistically impoverished, the English language. Yes, it's a very deep language as well. If you study Shakespeare, it's amazing. But the Quran, brother, the Arabic transcends this. That's why some ulama followed an opinion that Arabic was also a revealed language onto humanity, which is very interesting. And if you study the, psycho the philosophy of psychology, there's a approach, which is Chomsky. Noam Chomsky, he's known for his politics, but he's a very famous linguist. And the approach to language is what you call the innate grammar thesis, if you like. It's a broad category under the philosophy of psychology called nativism, that there are some innate things in our brain and in our mental structures. And one of these things that Chomsky argues is grammar itself. Because what he argues, and other linguists argue now, and other philosophers argue, that we have a primary linguistic data so the primary linguistic data as children is quite poor, it's not very rich. And yet, what children produce grammatically is greater or is far more complex than what they, what they received. So therefore they conclude there must be some specific innate structures in our mind that basically allow us to have grammar in a way. And they call them the innate grammar thesis or they call it the poverty of stimulus theory the universal grammar, and that's why what's very interesting according to some linguists, and it's an ongoing discussion, that they argue, which is very fascinating, that even children when they make grammatical mistakes, those mistakes are basically gramma grammatical structures of other languages. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that fascinating? 
So it goes to show that there may be a universal kind of grammar that we have. That Allah gave human beings universal grammar so we can learn different languages, right? So now obviously you have the empiricist, the empiricist attack, if you like, or the objection. They say, you know what? There's no such thing as a poor primary linguistic data. It's far more rich. We teach our children these grammatical structures. I've seen some of the data. I studied this. I studied the philosophy of psychology at university on a postgraduate level. And you know, there is an interesting debate between the empiricists and the nativists. But the debate continues. I'm obviously following with the Chomsky, Chomskyan kind of analysis here. There is a poverty of stimulus. What goes inside is quite impoverished. And what comes outside is quite more enriched. Therefore, there's some kind of innate grammatical, hypothetical module or space in our mind or our brain to basically allow us to develop the grammatical structures that we do. But anyway, I thought I'd mention this. Because Arabic is quite interesting because it's quite deep, it's quite mathematical, gives us an array of meanings. And this is quite profound because if you want to express yourself in a language and make sure that you're understood, then Arabic would be the best language to use because of its kind of depth. So it's the Arabic speech of Allah, which He revealed to Muhammad upon him be peace in wording and meaning. So the words are from Allah and the meaning is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And which has been preserved in the compiled written pages and it's reached to us by recurrent reporting. This is known as mutawatir reporting. The mutawatirat. Basically the different recurrent reporting that we received orally and hence we know the Quran is preserved. Now let me just break this down. We have in our tradition physical manuscripts of the Quran that basically are quite early. And these physical manuscripts are in line with what we know today of the Qur'an, okay? But I want to not dismiss this element, but just to show to you it doesn't really matter rationally. Because if tomorrow we travel to Yemen and we start digging near a mosque, an old mosque, and we find different Qur'ans that have 116 chapters, or have 200 chapters, or have some verses missing, this shouldn't really affect... Our belief, our rational belief that the Qur'an is preserved. It shouldn't affect it in any shape or form. Do you know why? Because traditionally the most primary method of establishing the preservation of the Qur'an wasn't through the written text. This was secondary. It was supportive. The primary aspect was oral, the oral tradition. And this is not like what they call, I don't know if, I don't know if it's PC to say this, but they call it Chinese whispers in England. I don't know if that's wrong. If it is, I do apologize. Let's call it... Cultural whispers, yeah? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, when someone whispers to somebody else, after 200 people down the line, they're going to be saying something totally different. Right. That's not the case because mutawatir, the mutawatirat, the recurrent reporting is not based on one chain. It's based on multiple chains. So let me give you the concept of mutawatir. For example, there's around, what, 50 people in this room? I say a sentence to you, right? And you memorize that sentence, <laughs> and each of... The 50 people in this room, you guys, you travel to your own neighborhoods and you have a different 50 people that you speak to and you say exactly the same thing. So this continues over time. So those 50 people go to different places as well, speak to another 50 people. So there are these different chains of people that haven't met, right? They haven't met and they took that knowledge from different chains of narration and yet after a thousand years, they say exactly the same thing. The millions of people say exactly the same thing. To claim that what they're saying is not what I said is irrational. Why? Because it's tantamount to a huge conspiracy. That they somehow took a time machine and they traveled to huge miles. So all these people from different places and times at different points of the chain of narration somehow conspired and met up. This is ridiculous. And this is why... We, we know that the Qur'an is based on mutawatir reporting. Go to North Africa. You go to some villages in North Africa, and you go to a mosque, and you ask them, I want to read the Qur'an, where is the mushaf? Where is the physical Qur'an? They, they, they won't give you one. <laughs> they would call a boy, Ya walad, oh my boy, come here. And the boy would ask you, what chapter do you want to read? So if you say Surah Al-Baqarah, he gets some paper, he starts writing out Surah Al-Baqarah for you. Right? And the point here is to show that they, there's some tribes in North Africa that have memorized the Qur'an completely without even reading it. All from an oral tradition. 
And each of these scholars have different chains of narration going all the way back to the Prophet Muhammad upon him be peace. And these chains are crisscrossing, right? Meaning they don't always meet. They go to other scholars or other ulama and other sahaba that memorize the Qur'an. Do you see? It's not one single chain. So if they're all saying exactly the same Qur'an, then you know it's, it's, it's preserved. And, you know, some, you know, Western inclined people, philosophically inclined people would argue, well, this is rubbish. This is absolute rubbish. No, it's not. Study Western philosophy. If you read the works of David Hume, when he had the discussion on testimony and miracles, he agreed and he said, you know what? We love testimony. We need it. You, you, don't, you can't have empirical understanding of the world if you don't rely on other, someone else's experience of the empirical world. And the only way to assess someone else's experience of the empirical world is to have testimony, believe in what they said, right? That's the nature of science. I had a debate with Professor Lawrence Krauss, as I, said this, I mentioned this earlier, and I asked him about, you know, you have a metaphysical claim that all knowledge is just empirical. That's a metaphysical claim. He said, but it's true, I just do the science, right? And I said to him, but hold on a second, there are other sources of knowledge. He said, like what? And I said, testimony, the say-so of others, oral transmission, discussion. Even if it's written, that's a form of testimony. He laughed at me. He said, I just do the science. So I said, okay, we'll do this science. I said, do you believe in evolution? He said, of course I do. He said, have you done all the science yourself? No. You have to read something in a book. You don't have the, the practical kind of capacity to learn everything about evolution and do the, 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 the science yourself. You have to rely on other scientists, which is testimony. And everyone started laughing at him because he exposed the fact that he had a false metaphysical assumption that basically everything... All knowledge is from the empirical world. No, you also have testimony. So David Hume agreed that you need testimony. And he even said, because this discussion was about miracles, and he even said that the only time he would believe in miracles, if it was mutawatir. He didn't use the word mutawatir, of course, he was a Scotsman. <laughs> so he didn't know Arabic, but he gave the concept. It's in his, I think it's in his dialogues, right? And basically what he says is this, if, hypothetically, there was, I think it's eight days of darkness in the 1600s, and different peoples from different times and places all said that they saw this eight days of darkness and it was transmitted by different masses of people, then he said it would be irrational, irrational. He said the scientists, the philosophers, the thinkers would have to believe in it. So he appreciated philosophically the rationality of mutawatir of recurrent reporting. He appreciated the rationality. But David Hume just didn't have an example. Because if he had the Qur'an, he would have known, right? And if he understood the tradition, he would have known. So the point I'm trying to say here is, we don't care what we find in the ground. And that's why we need to be careful when we discuss with people intellectually, and we have these crazy debates with people about, you know, is this really the Uthmani Codex or not? You know, is this, you know, do we have the Qur'an preserved? in a material form, this is irrelevant for us. And so we have to give them the more rational approach. We should show to them, we have recurrent reporting that will be irrational to deny because of masses of people transmitted to masses of people across different times and places exactly the same thing. And after 1400 years, we have exactly the same thing. So to deny it is like denying all types of truth. Do you see the point? I want mean, you to realize this because I don't want you to get affected when you go on YouTube and Google and you read silly books or you read some of the missionary material about the Quran, you know, someone burnt this or someone burnt that and someone said this. This is all rubbish. We have a robust philosophy of recurrent reporting, the Mutawatir, Mutawatir tradition. And if you study the Mutawatir tradition, you see that basically the Quran today is absolutely preserved. And this is what we have in our tradition. The textual stuff was always just supporting. It just supported the stuff. It just supported the oral tradition. So this makes sense. So let me just repeat that to you again. You have one person basically giving some testimonial knowledge to masses of people. These masses of people go individually and say the same thing to other masses of people at different times and places. And that continues for centuries. And if at the end you see all of these people saying exactly the same thing, yet they learnt it from different people at different times and places across different periods of time and different geographical locations, then it's absurd to deny it. Just like what David Hume said. So this is part of the philosophical tradition of the West as well. 
But it's unfortunate that many people who, who, who are involved in this stuff, they don't study. They don't study the philosophy. They don't read Hume. You know, they read someone's opinion on Hume. <laughs> they, you know, we don't read anymore. This is a shame. We're, we're people of Twitter and Facebook. Ahlal Twitter. Ahlal Facebook. <laughs> we need to be, you know, people of ilm, people of reading, you know. So, that's the Quran. Let me just continue now. So, what's very interesting, brothers and sisters, is that the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is very profound. So, we've defined it. We said it's in the Arabic language. We basically said that the book of Allah is preserved and it came to us by recurrent reporting. But let's go to the content now. When you look into the content of the book of Allah, and you don't come to the book of Allah with baggage, because you can come to the Quran with your own philosophy, with your own empirical reductionist di- you know, approach. If you go to the Quran with your kind of inferiority complexes, yeah? <laughs> you know, we hold a lot of baggage you know, when, in terms of philosophy and ideas. If you try to approach the Quran as a, with a blank canvas, then the Quran will speak to you. The Quran will speak to you. And what's interesting for me about the Quran, it's a very intrusive text. It's very intrusive. I remember reading the Quran before I was, before I was Muslim, and I was like, who the hell wrote this book? Who is this person? Because I was offended in some way. Because <laughs> I was ego and arrogant. I had ego and arrogance. Okay, I still have a bit of ego and arrogance. We are trying our best. But the point is, you know, I had ego and arrogance. And you know, when you read the Qur'an and it says to you, think about your origins. You are nutfatin min mani. You are a nutfa, a kind of mingled fluid from a despised fluid, semen, essentially, sexual fluid. That's what you are. That's what we are with sexual fluid coming together. That's it. Now for me, that's like an offense. I'm like, oh my God. Because my ego doesn't like that. My ego wants to think that Hamza Andreas Georges is amazing. My ego wants to say Hamza Andreas Dodis is the dawn, right? That Hamza Andreas Dodis is the boss, right? You know? <laughs> that, that's what the ego wants. The nature of the nafs, the nature of the ego is to basically say, I am right, you are wrong, I'm never going to be wrong, right? I want to impose myself on you, I don't want to be imposed upon. That's the nature of the nafs, that's the nature of the ego. And the Quran gives us conceptual medicine. If you read the Quran, it's medicine. And therefore, these ayat, these verses, they're very intrusive. And they, they're there to break the ego. Allah reminds you, you are nutfatin min maniyin. You are a mingled fruit from a despised fluid. And now you think you're boss. Now you think you're self-sufficient. Look at you, you came from sexual fluid. There were like almost an infinite number of physical variables that were put in place in order for you to be who you are now. Don't think you're independent. Don't think you're self-sufficient. Don't think you're a... Individual, you're not individuals. Yes, politically we have individual rights, okay, fine. But you're not, ontologically, you're not individual. Ontologically, meaning the source and nature of who you are, you are a individual. You're part of this collective whole. We're part of, we're part of this web of different connections with other human beings. We're one human family, you know. In order for you to be alive, sister, in order for you to be alive, brother, so many different mothers who are Muslim and non-Muslim had to suffer had to suffer throughout your whole history. We're all connected. Bani Adam, we're all connected. Do you see? So we all have these interconnections and we have to realize that we're not truly self-sufficient and independent, which makes us realize that we're human beings, we need to help each other, we're dependent on each other, and that means ultimately you're dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that's the whole point here. Don't think you're self-sufficient, you have this huge ego. So when you reflect on these ayat in a way that you're allowed to speak to you, it breaks your ego. That's who you are. You are despite you're a sexual fluid. And now you think you're somebody just because you got a few likes on Facebook and Twitter. You know, this should be on your Facebook profile. Right? If you want to be honest with who you really are, you're just a, you're just a mingled piece of sexual fluid. Now existentially, emotionally, psychologically, this should help us. It should help us in calming down the ego because arrogance, ego is a barrier to what? It's a barrier to Allah's mercy. It's a barrier to Allah's love. It's a barrier to Allah's guidance. Right? Look at shaitan. What was shaitan? He became a disbeliever because of what? Because of arrogance and ego. That's the spiritual point that we need to understand here. That arrogance is a huge barrier to divine rahmah, divine mercy, divine guidance. And it's because it was us. 
Alpha. Yeah? It was alpha. That's the important thing. Don't think Allah created your ego. Obviously, Allah creates everything metaphysically. But from this perspective, don't think, you know, oh, He created you as an evil person. No, you created yourself. <laughs> you created your own ego. And that's why the Quran is there to be intrusive and to break it down spiritually. But in saying that, the Quran is also very intellectual at the same time. It deals with the aql, not only the nafsiyah, the internal disposition, the psychology, but it deals with the intellect. And that's why Allah says in chapter 10, verse 24, وَكَذَلِكَ نُفَصِّلُ الْآيَاتِ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ And thus to explain our signs in detail for those يَتَفَكَّرُونَ For those who reflect. What does يَتَفَكَّرُونَ mean? It comes from the word فَاكَارَ If you study the root of فَاكَارَ it doesn't mean just ponder, just reflect. It doesn't mean be a desert romantic. You know, oh yeah, I'm reflecting, I'm looking at the stars, touching the sand, sitting on the deck chair, writing poetry to my beloved, and I'm drinking a, a pint of milk. Yeah? Just to make it halal. So, you know, it's not that kind of reflection. It's not that kind of reflection. The reflection you should be doing is a reflection that you try to understand the implications of that thing. And this is a neglected practice amongst the Muslims and non-Muslims. Malik Badri, who's a professor, he wrote a book, Contemplation, a Psycho-Spiritual Study, and he quotes the people of the past in our tradition. And he says that now we have a neglected ibadah, we have a neglected worship which is pondering. Allah mentions pondering all the time to think, to reflect, to use our aql, our intellect, but we don't, we suspend it. And this is, this is, this is, this is quite telling, it's a crisis of our time. But, but the people of the past, they would reflect on everything. They would even reflect on how ants moved. They would reflect on animals, on the cosmos. They would reflect within themselves. You know, there's a famous poet called Iqbal. He's from the East. And he said an amazing poet. He said, poem. He said, for the one who rejects the truth, the disbeliever, he is lost in the cosmos. But for the believer, the cosmos is lost in him. Right? Because if you think about it, and in themselves did they not reflect. We have a universe within ourselves. You know, some people say to me, Hamza, you travel a lot, right? You go to Hong Kong, to America, to this place and that place. People think I have a nice time. Trust me, I hate traveling, yeah? I mean, if you travel away from your family, you just get really sad and depressed. That's why I always cry when I watch cartoons on the plane. And I, I become like so emotional on the plane, I don't know why. <laughs> Actually, there are other speakers who do this. I think it's Sheikh Allah from... Uh, from Canada, he, I actually expressed this to him. He was like, you know what? And he's an alpha male, he's huge, he's big. And he was like, you know what, me too? <laughs> I cry on a plane. So I don't know what happens because you know what? A plane, if you have this tadabbur going on, airports and planes are symbols, are signs, are ayat, are indicators for death and akhirah. It's a transition, isn't it? It's a transition. <laughs> it's like the worldly, but it's like the world, worldly. Grave, if you like, or the barzakh, or whatever you want, yeah? And this is, this is important for us to reflect upon, because that's why a lot of people, they always ask forgiveness before they travel, right? It's a cliche amongst our community, please forgive me, akhi. You know, you didn't speak to him for six years, now you decide to travel, please forgive me, yeah? <laughs> because it awakens that within us. You know, reflect on airports. I know this is a bit of a digression, but reflect on airports. I remember I was picking up my mother-in-law, and I, I just like reflecting on people and stuff, right? And I saw this African man, and his whole family came, his wife, his kids, his older daughter, his little baby. And let me tell you something, yeah? The amount of joy and intense love, I was, I was crying. It was so overpowering and emotional, just reflecting on human beings' love for their family. That's a sign. That's an ayah for Allah's love, you know. Imagine if human beings could be that loving, imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the love of Allah is so pure because He doesn't need to love. We need to love to full hold. A mother needs to love to feel complete. Allah is al ghani He's independent and free, yet He loves. Imagine how pure that love is because He doesn't need to love. He gains nothing from loving. Anyway, so be people of reflection. And my point originally is, you know, I travel the world and say, why don't you go and see the Niagara Falls or this or that? One, I don't have time. But secondly, I know this sounds weird, but I don't care. You know what I say to people, and I know this sounds like too, like, oh, spiritual. It's not. It's, it shows that I'm just lost. Yeah? It's like, I haven't ever explored myself. I'm going to explore the whole world. You know? That's why sometimes I, I'm becoming an introvert. 
you know, honestly, I did the test, I'm an ambivert. I'm an extrovert when I give presentations like this, but after when it's six o'clock, I'm going straight to the hotel room. Bye. Ma salama. Because that's, that's, that's me. Because you, know, you like to be with your own thoughts and think about things. And you are a, a, you are a micro universe. There's a mini universe within you. Right? And that's why when you look outside, really, looking outside, it's still self-knowledge. Because all types of knowledge is self-knowledge. Because you are, the, you are the filter for that knowledge. If you don't know yourself properly, then you won't know the outside world anyway. Al-Ghazali, Al-Ghazali mentioned this in his Alchemy of Happiness. You think you know who you are. So he said, so you think you know who you are. When you're hungry, you eat. When you're angry, you fight. When you're enraged by the passions, you make love. That's not you. Animals do this. What's you is your inward self. And that's why he would argue that if you don't know yourself, you don't know Allah. Right? Because if you know that you're limited and dependent, if you know that basically you're weak, if you know that basically that you're dependent on Allah, on, on the ultimate cause, as independent, you know... These things, you know, these things, if you reflect within yourself, it leads to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really. And maybe that's why Allah says in the Qur'an that if you forget Allah, Allah will make you forget your own self, which shows that our self-knowledge is dependent on the worship and relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyway, so the Qur'an is quite intrusive and it does this in a positive way because it wants to positively intrude into the intellect and consciousness of the human being. And the Qur'an achieves us by asking questions. Whether you're Muslim or non-Muslim, if you read this book, you just feel intruded. (laughs) You know someone is speaking to you, at you directly, it's trying to help you. Look at this, understand this, have you not seen, right? Reflect, ponder, what's the matter with you, right? You know, making you wake up to certain realities. There's a day of judgment, there's a divine accountability. You know, there's a divine mercy waiting for you. It can't be forced on you because it'll have no meaning. Don't run away from divine mercy because you end up punishing yourself. As Allah says, don't blame me. When you go to the fire, blame your own hands. You did this, right? You run away from Allah's mercy. So embrace His mercy. Allah, you know, these themes are recurrent in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's interesting that even non-Muslim academics like Rosalind Ward Gwynn, she wrote a book, it's quite an interesting book. It's called Logic, Rhetoric, and Legal Reasoning in the Qur'an. It's published by Rutledge. She, she said, Reasoning and argument are so integral to the content of the Qur'an and so inseparable from its structure that they in many ways shape the very consciousness of Qur'anic scholars. That's what they said. So you appreciate that the Qur'an is very intrusive, gets you to think, discuss, argue in the best way. So... For me as well, brothers and sisters, when you look at the ayat of the Qur'an, and we discussed this earlier when we were discussing the multi-layered and multi-leveled aspect of the Qur'an, but let's repeat it. When you look at the ayat, the verses in the Qur'an that refer to natural phenomena, they have metaphysical and spiritual and existential implications, not crude scientific implications, because these things can change, our understanding can change. But when you reflect on phenomena, even with the naked eye, you're always going to have these metaphysical conclusions that... A power and a wisdom put this in place. Right? So when Allah says you were an alaqa, for example, you came from a blood clot or something that clings, or whatever meaning you want to have, you need to reflect on that reality and think, who created the physical causes in the universe in order for me to be formed like this from this lump of mess, <laughs> from this bloody mess, right? Who did that? There must be a wisdom and power in the universe, therefore he deserves to be worshipped. That's the kind of process. And Shabir Akhtar in his book, The Qur'an and the Secular Mind, of Philosophy of Islam, again published by the academic press, Rutledge, makes a very interesting point. And he talks about the kind of objectives of these ayat, the verses that refer to natural phenomena. He says, nature's flawless harmonies and the delights and liabilities of our human environment with its diverse and delicate relationships are invested with religious significance. Created nature is a cryptogram. It's a Greek word, grifto. Grifto means a hidden. It's a hidden message of a reality which transcends it. Nature is a text to be deciphered. Evidences accumulating in the material social worlds and in the horizons jointly point to a hidden immaterial order. The metaphysical conclusions of the fact that there is a power and wisdom and Allah deserves to be worshipped. Now, in saying this, brothers and sisters, the Qur'an not only makes you think, not only deals with your spiritual existential realities, But the Qur'an has a challenge, an intellectual challenge. 
The Quran says, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبِ مِمَّ نَزَلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِسُرَةٍ مِّنْ مِثْلِهِ وَدُعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ And if you're in doubt about this book, we have sent down to our servant referring to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then bring one chapter like it. And call on your witnesses and your supporters besides Allah in kuntum sadiqeen. If you're truthful in your claim, this is, this is an intellectual argument. You know, if you doubt this book, here's an argument. And this is absolutely interesting. We have other similar challenges in the Qur'an. For example, Allah says in the fourth chapter, Then do they not reflect upon the Qur'an? If it had been from any other than God, they, they would have found within it, Ikhtilafan kathira. Ikhtilafan kathira. Now there's very, something very interesting here. Very interesting. So the Qur'an is saying, if you think this wasn't from God, there'll be many contradictions, discrepancies. So there's two things you could do. Logically, the first thing you could do is read the whole Qur'an and try to find irreconcilable contradictions, which you can't. But if you're a logician, you could do something else. You could find out how many times the Qur'an mentions contradictions. There'll be much contradictions. Ikhtilafan kathira. Find how many times the, the word ikhtilafan is used. That form of the word is only used once. Just thought I'd mention that as a nice thing. <laughs> Amazing, huh? Just like in Surah Al-Baqarah, it's 286 verses. Do a karate chop in the middle, you find the 143rd verse. And in that verse, you find the word middle. Yeah. Interesting. Anyway, so the kind of intellectual aspect of the Qur'an that leads to many arguments for its miraculous nature has been attested by even non-Muslims. You have Professor Bruce Lawrence from Duke University in his book, The Qur'an of Biography, on page number 8. He says, as tangible signs, Qur'anic verses are expressive of an inexhaustible truth. They signify meaning, laid within meaning, light upon light, miracle after miracle. You also have, from our own tradition, as quoted by a suyuti Imam Fakhruddin, he said, It is inimitable, meaning the Qur'an is matchless, it cannot be matched, because of its eloquence, its unique style, and because it is free of error. And you have the famous Orientalist in his book, Islam, a Historical Survey, his name is Hamilton Gibb. He said, Well, if the Qur'an were, were his own composition, then other men can rival it. Because the Qur'an challenged the Arabs and they couldn't produce anything like it. And then he continues and says, let them produce 10 verses like it. And if they could not, and it is obvious that they could not, let them accept the Qur'an as an outstanding evidential miracle. So Hamilton Gibb here was representing what the traditional ulama scholars were saying. Now, the first argument I want to focus on, and this is where we're getting to the nitty gritty detail. The first argument that I want to focus on is the fact that the Qur'an has linguistic and literary inimitability. What does this mean? This means that the nature, feature, structure of the Arabic language cannot be emulated by a human being. If you use human agency and human capacity, you cannot emulate the book of Allah. I repeat, if you use human agency, human being, with his own capacity, he, they, the human being cannot emulate the book of Allah concerning the nature, feature, structure of the Arabic language. Now this opens an array of arguments from a technical perspective concerning the eloquence, and the rhetoric, but that's not our job today, because we want to articulate this to people who don't need to know any Arabic. So if you know the nitty gritty details, go to Bayyana Institute, go to Ustad Omar Khan, all of these great guys, go to your ulama, go study at Arabic universities and you study the science of balagha, the science of rhetoric and eloquence, and it's all there in our traditional uh, scholarship, okay? So that's for your own learning. But what I want to do is show that you could prove the Qur'an is a miracle, linguistic miracle, right? If you don't know any Arabic, and the one that you're speaking to know doesn't know any Arabic. You ready for this? Are you ready? Good. So what I want to use is something called testimony, as we've already discussed slightly uh, concerning this previously when we discussed epistemology. And I want to use inference to the best explanation. Don't worry if you don't know, don't know what this means, I'm going to explain. But before I do that, let me just give you some important background information. Now, remember, when the Qur'an came to challenge the Arabs in the 7th century, there was a certain linguistic historical context. What was that context? That the Arabs of Revelation were the best Arabic linguists par excellence, right? They could express themselves in the Arabic tongue better than anybody else. It was like the Shakespearean period of the Arab world. 7th century, Mecca, Arabia... They reached the summit of 
linguistic ability. And what's interesting is because the environment of the time was a homogeneous linguistic environment. What is a homo homogeneous linguistic environment? It means that there wasn't too much linguistic boring. A heterogeneous linguistic environment is too much linguistic boring. We have this today in Arabic cultures. You go to Egypt, you ask where is the phone? You're supposed to say, Aina Hatif. But what do they say? Aina Telefoon. Yeah? If you say you want some chocolate in some villages in Iraq, you know, you should say the appropriate language, Uridu, I would like, and chocolate, right? But what do they say now? Uridu Nestle. Nestle. Yeah, the effect of globalization, linguistic borrowing, yeah? You know, turn off the television, yeah? So basically, there's so much linguistic borrowing, um, the scholars say there's been a linguistic degeneration. This happens, if you study the works of Yule, he's a linguist, you'll see that linguistic borrowing is a natural phenomenon. But the time of Arabia, when they took, if, when they took words from other cultures, they internalized it in the Arabic language. It wasn't completely foreign. It became part of the structure of Arabic, which is very unique, especially when you see foreign words in the Quran. Those words were already naturalized in the Arabic language, and that's the opinion, I believe, of Suyuti and Imam Sha'afi. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on them. So, the important background information here is, the Arab linguists were the best at expressing themselves in the Arabic tongue. To be a poet at that time, it wasn't like this, you know, study on YouTube for a week. <laughs> It wasn't like that. It's that you had to go with a linguist, linguistic master for 10 years. It was like almost becoming a Jedi. <laughs> Honestly, you had to go and train. If you look at the old Star Wars movies, Luke Skywalker, he's with that green guy, Yoda, who's basically a Sufi monk. You know, <laughs> Everyone wants a Yoda at home, right? Everyone loves Yoda. You know, even my son loves Yoda. He's a paint me green and he wants his ears like that. You know? I don't, they don't watch TV, but he accidentally watched me watching something on YouTube. <laughs> it was Yoda fighting, yeah? I thought it was so cool. You know, some of Yoda's wisdom, yeah? Anyway, so he called me and said, I want to be like that. <laughs> anyway, point here is, they had to master it. They had to be like the Jedi of poetry. And they sat with a master for 10 years, and sometimes they moved away from the city. So they basically internalized the nuances of the language, right? And this, this was a big study. At university, three years, <laughs> four years, maybe in America. But for them to become a linguistic, poetic master, a decade, right? That's like what, you get two PhDs in that time, right? So the point I'm trying to say is, there was a social environment that created these people, and that's why Ibn Rashid, he basically says the Arabs used to congratulate each other only on the birth of a boy, and when, and, and when a poet rose amongst them. So you see there was a socialization that being a male it was a patriarchal society and basically being a poet was, that's it. And this is equivalent of being a doctor in this culture, right? You're a doctor, ah, you know, you're like the Imam Mahdi, <laughs> right? You're the savior, right? You're, you're excellent. He's a doctor, therefore he's going to paradise, yeah? That's, that's how we, you know, it's ridiculous, it's a job, man. You know, if he has the right intentions, if he prays, if he's a good ethical person, that's the important thing. Not if he, you know, studied medicine. I mean, that's a good thing as well, don't get me wrong. If you save a life, it's like saving the whole of humanity. But sometimes we think status and job is everything. But what's more important is, you know, the Prophet ﷺ said, Indeed, Allah doesn't look at your shapes and your forms, but He looks into your hearts. You know, that's the important thing. So the point here is there was important background information. There was a socialization of language, meaning that the Arabs at the time of Revelation were Arabic linguists par excellence. And this is attested by Muslim and non-Muslim scholarship. Now, what's very interesting, brothers and sisters, is since we know that information, let's now, we know that background information, let's now articulate an argument to prove the Qur'an's a linguistic miracle without knowing any Arabic. So the first thing I want to do is go through the concept of testimony, because an important concept for us to have to use for this argument. Now, what I want to show to you is that testimony, which according to epistemologists is the say-so of others, right? This is a valid and fundamental source of knowledge with conditions. Now, the difference of opinion amongst epistemologists historically was that testimony was useful but not fundamental, or that testimony is useful and fundamental. It's a fundamental source of knowledge. And the way I want to articulate this is First and foremost, give some academic discussion on testimony, then 
we'll talk about if the world is flat or round. All right? So, Benjamin McMillan, he's an associate professor. He wrote a really interesting book called Truth, Authority, Truth, Testimony, Truth, and Authority, published by Oxford. He said, Testimony is concerned with how we acquire knowledge and justified belief from the say so of others. You also have the famous C.A. Cody. He wrote the book Testimony of Philosophical Study. His book in the 90s was basically created a, a milestone in epistemology concerning testimony. It revived this discussion. And he made a really good point. He said, look, many of us have never seen a baby born, nor have we examined the circulation of the blood, but we believe to be true how these things happen. We learn them from books, which is testimonial knowledge. We don't test it ourselves usually, right? Now, the interesting discussion about testimony is, as you know, quite, not heated, but it's quite lively. I want to focus on a few points. The first point is, I want to show to you that testimony is a fundamental source of knowledge. And the way to prove this is by contrasting Cody's views with David Hume. We mentioned this earlier, just to repeat, David Hume basically said testimony is useful, but we only accept testimonial knowledge if it's aligned with our collective experiences. But Cody basically argues, saying, hold on a second, what do you mean by collective experiences? Because collective experiences can only be understood by testimony. If you just relied on your own single empirical experiences, you would never have science and you wouldn't have no knowledge. So what's intrinsic within even the scientific method and empiricism in itself is the fact that you have to trust the say-so of others. So it shows that testimony is fundamental. Then you have the likes of Dr. Elizabeth Fricker in her essay, Testimony and Epistemic Autonomy. She basically said that, look, we have to rely on experts. We don't know everything ourselves, do we? She says, given my limitations as parametric, I'm, I'm limited, my memory is limited, my aql, my intellect is limited, I can't know everything, so I have to rely on the say-so of others, right? Authorities, when you go to the doctor, you don't say to them, prove it that I'm ill, or prove it that I've got a common cold, what do you know? You don't have the background knowledge, you're not an authority in the matter. Imagine, you know, being on the plane, and the pilot says, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be experiencing turbulence, some severe turbulence, please fasten your seatbelt. You're like, no, you just disobey. Prove it. Yeah, and the minute it happens, your head's banging and you, you know, have concussion. We trust the pilot, we buckle up, because we know he's an authority in this particular matter. Also, you have professor of philosophy, he's an emeritus professor, Keith Lehrer. He, he wrote basically the essay called Testimony and Trustworthiness, and he focuses on trust. His argument is very brilliant because it's in line with our tradition. He basically says, you have to be trustworthy in your assessment in the trustworthy or trustworthiness of others to accept the testimonial knowledge. What does this sound like to you? Ilm al-Hadith, the study of Hadith. In Hadith, you have the Matan, the text, you have the Isnad, the chain of narration. Each person in the chain has to be what? Trustworthy. And we have to be trustworthy in making assessments about them too. They're studying this right now. We had this 1400 years ago. Also, you have the assistant professor Benjamin McMillan. He basically argues that we have a right to referral, meaning for testimonial knowledge to be valid, the person receiving the testimony, he has to have the kind of right or responsibility to refer back to that person, meaning to challenge them. And the person giving the testimonial knowledge has to have the ability to respond to those challenges. If they both take that responsibility or that right, then that is testimonial knowledge. The point I'm just saying, you don't have to know this in detail, but it's to show that testimony is a lively discussion in Western epistemology. It's part of our tradition in Islam, right? As you know, the science of hadith, the Quran, etc. And it's a valid and fundamental source of knowledge. And the way I want to basically explain this to you, as you can see in the picture, there's a nice picture of the world here, is I want you to prove to me the world is round. Now we had this discussion earlier with one of the experiences I spoke to you about. And you know many of us, we can't even prove empirically the world is round. We refer to pictures, images, Google Maps, what we read in the books, the scientists, the toys, the globes, right? We don't have empirical evidence ourselves, that we have ourselves. So it shows that everything else that we, we use to prove the world is round is based on testimonial evidence. We haven't done the math. We haven't basically going into space, 
We haven't studied the kind of alternation of the night and day. We haven't done this stuff. We just accept it. I'm not saying the world is flat, by the way. Of course the world is round. But what I'm trying to say is that a lot of our knowledge is based on testimony. Right? So, this brings up the point that testimony is a valid source of knowledge. Agreed? Good. So now you know testimony is a valid source of knowledge. So let's find out what the testimonials are concerning the book of Allah. Let's go to the experts. Let's go to the say-so of others from the Western and Eastern tradition and find out what they say about the Qur'an. By the way, their testimony is not about the miraculous nature of the Qur'an. Their testimony is about the language, that it's inimitable, matchless, unique, right? Cannot be emulated. Now, I'm not going to give you the whole list that we have, but for example, you have uh, Shah Wali Allah in his Al-Fawz Al-Kabir, Kabir Fi Usulul Tafsir, he basically said about the Qur'an, the employment of lucid words and sweet constructions gracefully and without affectation that we find in the tremendous Qur'an is to be found nowhere else in any of the poetry of the early or later peoples. You have Martin Zamet, who's a Dutch professor. He wrote the book, A Comparative Lexical Study of Qur'anic Arabic. He said, notwithstanding the literary excellence of some of the Pre, long pre-Islamic poems The Qur'an is definitely On a level, level of its own As the most eminent written manifestation Of the Arabic language So we have testimonies And we know testimonies are a bad source of knowledge About the uniqueness and inimitability Of the Qur'anic discourse But you may argue Hold on a second Hamza Don't we have counter testimonies That say the opposite about the Qur'an That's true That's true but, but there's counter-testimonies for many things. There are some people who claim the world is flat. That's also testimonial knowledge. Right? Obviously you don't believe it to be true. So why are we going to dismiss the counter-testimonies? Very simple. There are a few main reasons I want you to understand. When some so-called Arabic Western scholars say the Qur'an is not inimitable, doesn't have amazing constructions of Arabic language, when they say this, they have to literally reject Arabic linguistic history, Arabic liter literary history. Because it's well known that the 7th century Arab was the best place at articulating the Arabic language, at conveying the Arabic language, at expressing the Arabic language. They, they now, who've just learned a very limited level of Arabic, right? They now, who come from a heterogeneous linguistic environment, they, it's not their first language, they now somehow claim that actually, no, it's not inimitable. If anyone could claim such a thing, it would be the Arabs at the time of Revelation, but they never did so. Because they were Arabic linguists and they said, this is beyond us. They accused it of being magic or out of this world or from the unseen, right? So they have to make up a new Arabic history. Why would we believe them? You know, the onus of proof was on them. You have to remake Arabic literary history, my friend. All of a sudden, you have limited Arabic knowledge, you just learnt it for three years at university. Right? You're, it's your second language and now you think you could pass a linguistic judgment? You're shallow. And what's interesting, they have to also claim greater linguistic ability than the 7th century Arab. Which no one would even respect anyone saying that. Because the 7th century Arab came from a unique linguistic culture and society. There were Arabic linguists par excellence. The Orientalist, he comes not from, from not a unique linguistic culture. It's a hodgepodge of different, you know, languages. There's linguistic boring, it's a heterogeneous linguistic society. He's learned modern standard Arabic, really. He hasn't gone really deep into the classical Arabic. So that's another problem. The other problem is for me though, which is, which is quite interesting, is that many of these guys make tremendous linguistic mistakes. For example, Noldeke, he's known to be a German Orientalist, he belittled the Qur'an. Do you know what he said about the Qur'an? You know, he learns a bit of Arabic. He's supposed to be a scholar and he says, oh, the Qur'an is, you know, doesn't make sense. It's got grammatical mistakes. It's, it's got problems. And basically the language is not, you know, it's, it's, it's not coherent. It's, it, it's haphazard, right? Now, what's interesting, Noldeke made that judgment on the Qur'an because of something called referencing swish, um, shifting or what's called as the dynamic style of the Qur'an or known in Arabic as iltifat. Iltifat literally means moving from one direction to the other. Because in the Qur'an you see change in gender, change in number, change in pronoun. You notice this in the Qur'an. Us, we, your Lord, Allah, right? Changes from dual to the plural, it has these changes, right? 
And it may look haphazard from the person who's not sensitive to the language. And he's not sensitive to the language. But if you studied classical Arabic, Balagha, you will know iltifat is a science. It's an amazing science that increases, enhances the communicative effect of the Qur'an. The Qur'an's effect in terms of its communication skyrockets because of this dynamic style. Even Neil Robinson, Professor Neil Robinson in his book Discovering the Qur'an, a contemporary approach to the text, he has a whole chapter that's called the dynamic style of the Qur'an and he discusses these nuances. Let me give you an example. Allah says in the shortest chapter, Inna atayna kal kawthar, right? Inna atayna kal kawthar, fasalli li rabbika wanhar, inna shani akahu al aptar. Allah is saying, verily we have given you, referring to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the abundance, al kawthar River in paradise, but it can mean abundance as well. Kathara, you know, kathir, akhtaru, etc. So indeed, we have given you the abundance. What's the second verse? So, therefore, for salli, therefore pray to your Lord and sacrifice. Where's the shift? The shift is from we to your Lord. The first personal pronoun is we. The second is your Lord. You know, it's the shift. But every single shift in the Quran, grammatical shift, every single shift in the Quran is in line with the meaning and it increases the effect. For example, we is used for power and ability. We have this in European literature as well when kings would refer to themselves as we. We have given you the abundance, right? We have given you, we have the ability. And the second verse, so the verse is about we have given you the abundance. So it's about ability, power, majesty. The second verse is about sacrifice and spirituality and prayer. For rabbika wanha. Therefore pray to who? Your Rabb. You know what Rabb means? It doesn't just mean your Lord or Master. It means the one that nurtures you, the one that cares for you, the one that loves you. Do you see the shift? So the first personal pronoun is in use for ability and power. We, the majestic, we have given you the abundance. The second is for intimacy. Therefore pray to your Rabb. Ya Rabb. Yeah? Do you see how many? This is in the whole of the Quran. And study it, you'll see every time there is a shift on gender, number, or pronoun, it's in line with the meaning. That's why New Robinson says this is the dynamic style of the Quran. Professor Abdul Hanim, if you Google it, there's an academic paper that he wrote on the grammatical shifts in the Quran. And that's why Noldika, he had a very shallow understanding of the Arabic language. That's why we reject the counter testimonies. The Arabic is not good, they have to remake the Arabic literary history, right? And they have to claim that they're better Arabic linguists than the 7th century Arab, which is impossible. It's like me or you saying that you're better than Shakespeare. You'd be laughed at. <laughs> right? Make sense? So we have a valid testimony. The Quran is unique linguistically. Now let's move to inference. What is inference? Inference to the best explanation is a valid, indispensable form of reasoning, brothers and sisters. Okay? For example, when you go to the doctor, the doctor makes an inference. She has some background information about her studies at university in medical school. She looks at your data of your symptoms and she understands there are different explanations for those symptoms and she picks the best explanation. For example, if you come with a runny no nose, slightly unwell, not too high temperature and you're quite young, she concludes you have the common cold. That's the inference to the best explanation. Another example, say you're babysitting your nephew you're upstairs brushing your teeth. You tell your nephew, time to sleep. Mommy said no cookies before you go to sleep, okay? And then you're brushing your teeth. He falls asleep and you do something else. You get busy. Then you go back down remembering that he's downstairs. And you see him on the couch like this. Sleeping. He's got crumbs on his cheek, right? He's got crumbs on his pajamas. There's a cookie jar that's open with half the cookies gone. What's the inference to the best explanation? That this happened by chance? Or that given the background information of your nephew that he's a bit of a cheeky so-and-so, given the fact that he already wanted cookies, the best explanation is that he ate the cookies. But you didn't see him eat them, you just see the signs, the data. So you infer the best explanation which he ate the cookies. Make sense? And inference of the best explanation we've been used for science. We found out about a new planet called Neptune because of the perturbations of Uranus. Uranus was wobbly. 
Right? And they inferred there must be an eighth planet. Right? They had to change the auxiliary assumptions. They had to change the background assumptions. Right? They're not going to deny the laws of physics. They said there must be something with our, with our assumptions. And the assumptions were there's no other planets. So they said there must be another planet. That was an inference. So we use inference for everything. Yes, some inferences may be wrong, but some could be conclusive if you exhaust all the data. Now, there's a really good book by Peter Lipton, the philosopher. He wrote the book, Inference to the Best Explanation. He published by Rootledge. And he basically said, the doctor infers that his patient has measles since this is the best explanation of the evidence before him. The astronomer infers the existence of the motion of Neptune since this is the best explanation of the observed perturbations of Uranus. Giving our data and our background beliefs, we infer what would, if true, provide the best of the competing explanations we can generate of those data. So what have we done so far? We've concluded that testimony is a fundamental source of knowledge, yes or no? Yes. We've concluded that inference to the best explanation is an indispensable source of reasoning, yes? Good. So now we have testimonies concerning the Qur'an that we could believe to be true and we can reject the counter-testimonies because it's based on weak Arabic, based on conspiracy of the Arabic literary history, etc, etc. Now we can start using the inference to the best explanation. So since it's true, based on our testimonial knowledge that the Qur'an is unique, we've, we've done no Arabic at the moment, it's all historical, it's all rational. We can now start thinking about what's the best explanation. We have four competing explanations. Number one, it came from an Arab. Number one, it came from a non-Arab. Number two, the Quran came from Muhammad upon whom, be ple- upon whom be peace. Or number four, it came from God, Allah. So let's do this together rationally. You ready? Are you awake? Yes. Good. So could it come from an Arab? No way. First piece of evidence. The best Arabic linguists, who were the best linguists, they could express themselves better than anybody else in the Arabic tongue. They even admitted failure. After the initial accusation that it was from Muhammad upon whom be peace, they start saying it's magic, learn it from somebody else. A group of people came together, right? And the best linguist of the time was Walid, Walid ibn al mughira Look what he says. He said, and what can I say? For I swear by God, there is none amongst you who knows poetry as well as I do, nor can any compete with me in composition or rhetoric. Not even in the poetry of the spirit world. And yet I swear by God, Muhammad's speech, meaning the Quran, does not bear any similarity to anything I know. And I swear by God, the speech that he says is very sweet and he's adorned with beauty and charm. Now, he didn't become Muslim because someone lied to him in a way and guaranteed that he won't go to hell. And there was an ayah about him. When Allah says, leave this one alone. Yeah. And what's interesting, the word alone or you know, is... Uh, it's only used once as well in that form. Anyway, so what's very interesting for me though is the social political dimensions. Because think about this. The Quran came as a spiritual book to talk about you should worship Allah, don't worship yourself, don't worship your ego, don't worship society, worship Allah, which is to love Allah, to know Allah, to obey Him, to sing all, all acts of worship to Him alone, and that to affirm His uniqueness and transcendence. Now, this is, this is worship. And the implications of that worship was that the Muslims of the time were accounting the Arabs of the time, saying you have unjust economics. They were saying that, you know, your idols are false gods. They were basically saying, you know, deal with the injustices. They were just basically taking them to account. And this affected the socio-economic power of the Arab leaders of the time. So they had so much motivation to try and disprove the Qur'an. All they had to do is produce three lines like it, one chapter like it, but they failed. They had the linguistic ability to try and do it, but they didn't because they know they couldn't. Instead of producing three lines like it, what did they resort to? War, boycott, murder, calamity, fitna, facade, chaos. But they had all the social political motivations to try and challenge the Quran, but they failed. And that's why the academic, Navid Karmani, in the Blackwell Companion of the Quran, in his essay, Poetry and Language, he makes a brilliant point. He says, obviously, the Prophet ﷺ succeeded in this conflict with the poets. Otherwise, Islam would not have spread like wildfire. Because if the Qur'an wasn't truly an inimitable text, a text that cannot be matched, it's linguistically superior. If it wasn't, then why would the Arabs, who already had amazing linguistic ability, why would they accept Islam? 
Why would they accept a falsehood? Especially since the Quran undermined the social economic realities of the time. Do you see my point? It's such a rational point. So it couldn't come from an Arab. And we know it can't come from today's Arab, which is very obvious, because as we discussed earlier, today's Arab has come from a linguistically heterogeneous society, too much linguistic boring, there's linguistic degeneration. The society of the time was more homogeneous, meaning they had more natural intuitive ability to, to you know, instantaneously bring out amazing poetry. It's like Al-Mutanabbi. Al-Mutanabbi is one of the greatest poets of the Arabic world. So, it can't come from an Arab. What's the next option? Non-Arab. Well, this is, come on, an easy argument. The Quran makes this very clear in chapter 16. Allah says, And indeed, we know that they, the polytheists and pagans, say, It is only a human being who teaches him. The tongue of the man they refer to is foreign. While this Quran is, Arabiyun Mubin. This Quran is pure clear Arabic. So how can you say it came from a foreigner? Do you see my point? And this is a rational discussion. You can't say the Quran came from a Chinaman. Right? From Chinese person. It's in pure Arabic. Right? And if you study linguistics, when you adopt a second language, you can never express yourself like someone who's had it as a first language, for example. And even the kind of a linguistic environment you're brought up in, it affects the way you express yourself. Unfortunately, in the Arab world, you don't have that classical 7th century environment of the purity of the Arabic language. So it can't come from an Arab. It can't come from a non-Arab. We're nearly there. And we've used nothing about Arabic. Just historical, rational stuff. Testimony, inference, history. Now some would argue, maybe it came from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is absolutely false. This is what they... Clutch at intellectual straws. I have an array of reasons why it couldn't have come from Muhammad upon him be peace. Number one, logically, he was an Arab. If the best Arabs failed, then it follows and he couldn't do it either. It just logically follows. And also, the Prophet ﷺ, he wasn't known to acquire linguistic expertise. He didn't go for 10 years and study Arabic, right? The mastery of poetry. He didn't engage in the Uqqa's fair. At that time, there was a fair that they used to debate with poetry. He wasn't known for this, Right? The second point is, after the initial accusations, the Arabic linguists at that time, they never accused him of being the author. They said it was somebody else. It was a group of people, or it was magic, or it was from the spirit world. The third point, the Qur'an is known to be a literary masterpiece. There's a book I have at home, it's called like the greatest literary pieces of, of, of the world. There's a whole chapter about the Qur'an. It's written by a non-Muslim, this is well known. The Qur'an is a literary masterpiece. But what's very interesting, when you study literary masterpieces, they go through changes and additions. The Qur'an wasn't stylistically edited or changed. As it was revealed, it was preserved. And yet it remained as a literary masterpiece. But when human beings make literary masterpieces, they do it over time. Editing, changes. But the Qur'an doesn't suffer from those stylistic Additions and changes. That's phenomenal. The fourth point. Consider the psycholinguistic content. If you study psycholinguistics, you look into a text and you know some of the psychology of the author. If you read Shakespeare, you know some of Shakespeare's in Shakespeare. If you re read the Iliad, you know it's some of Homer, Homer is, in, is in the Iliad, the Greek writer, right? This is well known. Just study like basic book on psycholinguistics, grounded theory, discourse analysis. Just check it out. The point here I'm trying to make is the psychological content of the Qur'an is in the divine voice. It's not in the prophetic voice, meaning it doesn't reflect the emotions of the chaotic life of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace. He was boycotted from his beloved city. He was stoned by children in a town in Arabia. He was abused. He was nearly murdered. His companions were killed. He went to war. He was so hungry, tied two stones to his stomach because of the boycott of Mecca. His wife passed away, his beloved wife Khadija radiallahu anha. His son passed, sons passed away. Right? People hated him, abused him, yet he was so, had so much forbearance. He suffered. And yet none of these emotions from a psycholinguistic perspective are in the Qur'an. The Qur'an remains in a divine voice. This is almost a psychological impossibility. The fifth point, which I think is a very brilliant rational point for you to understand. When you look at human expressions, brothers and sisters, you see that when someone writes something or does some artwork, 
if you have the tools that they had, you could copy it. You could emulate it. We see this in Picasso. Just, just write replicas of Picasso. You see, some replicas of Picasso are so accurate because they know they have the blueprint, they have the, br the right brushes, the right uh, paints used, the style used. They have the tools at their disposal. Even when it comes to language, you can emulate someone's language, their style, if you have the tools, the grammar, the words. What's interesting is we have the blueprint of the Qur'an, which is the Qur'an itself. We know the words are, what the grammar is, what the sounds are. We have the tools, the Arabic grammar, the finite letters and words. But we can't use those tools to emulate the Qur'an. But if it was human expression, you should be able to do that. Just like with all humans, human expression. Make sense? And that shows that it can't come from a human being. Now what's very interesting, I love this, right? Consider this linguistic study. There was a linguistic study done, it's called Author Discrimination Between the Holy Qur'an and the Prophet's Statements. You can find it in the journal, Literature and Linguistic Computing, Volume 27, Number 4, 2012. They applied some linguistic analyses on the Qur'an and the prophetic statements found in Sahih al-Bukhari. And there's many results, but let me give you one of the results. I've got this paper, I can send it to you. And the results are fascinating. Just listen to this. 62% of the hadith, the prophetic words, are untraceable in the Qur'an. And 83% of the Qur'anic words are untraceable in the hadith. This shows that they had two different authors. From a linguistic, pragmatic perspective. They, there's a two different distinct type of vocabularies used over a 23 year period which indicates there are two different authors Hadith, the mouth of the Prophet wasallam, but yet it's inspiration but Quran, meaning and wording is from Allah and two distinct type of vocabularies Isn't that amazing? Now study the work of Eminem, the rapper, right? And study his normal language The vocabulary interchanges but there's such a huge distinction here from a computational perspective, it's impossible to say they had the same author which supports our thesis. Now before we conclude on this section, one would argue, what about maybe Muhammad Sassam was a genius? But let me bring you back to the original point we made about literary masterpieces. A genius who produces a literary masterpiece, what does he do? It's not instantaneous. It goes through time and addition. Like Shakespeare. He didn't have sustained unedited, instantaneous eloquence and rhetoric. No. Even Al-Mutanabbi, some of the Arabic scholars, they love Al-Mutanabbi so much, one of the most famous Arabic poets of the time. The most famous. And yet even his work was changed and borrowed. If you look at Al-Hatimi's criticism of Al-Mutanabbi, you see that Al-Mutanabbi admits in his biographical data, oh, I copied from somebody else, or had some, he had some grammatical mistakes. Even Professor Bonabaka, who studied this about Al-Mutanabbi, you know, he didn't have sustained eloquence over a period of time. It was changed and edited and there were some mistakes. So even if you claim genius, well, the features of a linguistic genius is that the masterpiece is developed over time, but the Qur'an, it was stylistically unedited. As it was revealed, it was never changed. So what's the best conclusion? What's the inference to the best explanation? It came from Allah. It can't come from an Arab. It can't come from a non-Arab. It can't come from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Therefore, it must come from Allah. And this inference of the best explanation is not uncertain. Why? Because we've, got, we've exhausted all of the data. Right? You're not going to have a new history of the Arabic language. It's all there. Do you see my point? Now, one would argue, and I've heard this from Christian missionaries. I gave this kind of talk at the School of Oriental and African Studies, I gave a similar presentation and some academic missionary said, well done, but maybe it came from the devil. So I said to him, well, how do you know the devil exists? And he said, well, your Quran says so. I said, oh, so you believe in the Quran, do you? So we don't have a problem. I said, okay, let me change it, uh, because the Bible says so. I said, fair enough. Well, now you have to prove the Bible is true. The onus of proof is on you, because the only foundation you have to believe in this unseen spirit, the devil, is in your text. Prove your text to me now. Do you see my point? So they can't use it as an argument. So, from this perspective, this section, we'll end on this section, brothers and sisters. We've gone through a bit of a journey in this one hour, 20 minutes. This has, by the way, been live on Facebook for people to listen to.
I'm going to stop it though, I think they're getting bored. So basically what we've done is we basically discussed what the Qur'an is, the intrusive spiritual nature of the Qur'an, the fact that it makes you think and ponder, has an intellectual challenge. One of these challenges is the linguistic inimitability. We don't have to know any Arabic to articulate this to a non-Muslim. All we have to show is that testimony is a valid source of knowledge and fundamental. We have to show that inference to the best explanation is a valid form of reasoning, which we use all the time. When we look at the testimonies of the Qur'an, we accept them. We don't have to accept the counter-testimonies because they're weak. They're based on some crazy fallacies, right? And once we have this, then we make our inference. Did it come from an Arab? Did it come from a non-Arab? Did it come from Muhammad upon whom be peace? Or did it come from God? We break it down with the arguments that's given, which are very rational and historical, very causal arguments. Don't need to know anything about Arabic. Just understand the history and the reality of the time. And then you conclude rationally, it had to come from Allah. It's a very powerful argument. Yes, it may take long to articulate, but what I'm going to do during this workshop is get you guys to be able to do it in five minutes. Who wants to be able to do this in five minutes? Put your hand up. Excellent. And let me just say bye to the Facebook guys. Assalamu alaikum, Facebook guys.